involved in Advance Portland generally, and I think we've all received some, um, you know, community input from. Uh, that's part of our job as board members is to sort of be the face of the bureau and to, um, you know, to engage with community members as we go along. And so, uh, so like for my part, I was involved in the development of the plan and heard a lot from different people about about it as we went along. So. I'll, I'll uh, also offer thanks to our board members for showing up during many of those portions. And so, you know, Tava, whether it was us in City Hall and gathering folks uh, both in a hybrid uh, space, it was great to know that our board members were right next to us, listening alongside our consultants who were who were tasked with doing this all, uh, with us. So the extensive outreach, uh, the connection, and having board members right next to staff as we were literally gathering that input uh, felt invaluable and really informed the process, such as uh, what uh, Chair, Ta uh, Chair Cruz, excuse me, has has mentioned. Thank you. Chair Cruz, while, while we have you, <laughs> um, I noticed that you were one of the three signatories on the letter that accompanied the report. The mayor, yourself, and Commissioner Rubio yes. were the signatories. Mm -hmm. And you were also on the steering committee? Yes. Can you share with us a little bit of the role of the steering committee and also what role will you have in the go forward aspect of implementing this plan? Well, um, I don't recall exactly how many meetings we had of the steering committee, uh, but we had quite a few. <laughs> and, uh, and we had, uh, you know, our, our role was really to, um, you know, to engage with staff and to engage with our consultants, because we had consultants involved in this too. This was not just independently developed by the agency. It was, all, we had expertise from, uh, some, from some very uh, qualified and talented folks. Um, and then, you know, from, you know, go, on a going forward basis, I mean, that's part of our role as, as commissioners uh, for Prosper Portland is to watch this and kind of supervise this plan be implemented citywide. So, um, so I expect that we'll get ongoing updates. We, you know, that's part of the plan. Um, and we'll be monitoring this as we go forward, um, whether it be in budget discussions or just implementation discussions. Uh, there'll be new initiatives that will come along that we'll be engaged with. There'll be a lot of different, I think, touch points as we go forward. Um, so I hope that answers your question. I don't know, yes. but yeah. So I have the next question. Um, so now you have a plan. Congratulations. <laughs> and I uh, haven't spoken to the city. We know that it was approved. Yes. And Margo also mentioned the signatories. So we know you have an assigned and approved plan. Yes. And um, so our question uh, has to do with some of the work um, that might be reflected in the budget for the upcoming year. Is there any of that? And the second part of that is how are you going to be doing business differently as a result of the plan? Okay, good, very good questions, and I do have a prepared response for that one. <laughs> <laughs> the others were on the fly. <laughs> but if I could actually amend, I'd like to amend my last response, if you don't mind. If I, forgive me for being lawyer, lawyerly here. But um, I just, you know, one thing, one other thing, point I would note uh, with respect to ongoing implementation and monitoring. You know, there's been a little bit of change as to how PROSPER uh, is integrated into the city council supervision. So Commissioner Rubio, this is part of Commissioner Rubio's portfolio now, mm -hmm. and she has the Bureau of Planning Services and whatnot. Um, and these other uh, bureaus that she's in charge with kind of fit with our bureau. And I think that's going to be a good development in terms of Im implementation of the plan and kind of crossing through some silos at City Hall. And hopefully that model will um, go forward as we change our uh, governance structure next year too. As you all know, uh, we're headed into that, uh, which, <laughs> which people have different feelings about. But, um, but hopefully, that, hopefully things will, that efficiency will continue on as well. So I just wanted to throw that out there. All right, back to, to responding to your question. Uh, the fiscal year 2023 to 2024 budget was developed in anticipation of the of Prosper Portland's board endorsement and city council adoption. First, the advanced Portland plan is not a one-year, but rather a longer-term plan with individual initiatives identified to begin in, in the next year, the next three years, and the next five years. 
moving forward into fiscal year 2024 to 25, the budget development process, staff will intentionally allocate resources to deliver advanced Portland priorities, particularly those identified in the implementation timeline for the next year. Examples of how the advanced Portland recommendations were reflected in our budget include new funding from City Council to move forward TIF district exploration processes in East Portland and the Central City, pivoting traded sector general fund supported work to refine and deliver on updated cluster action plans, including launching a new food and beverage manufacturer, manufacturing cluster and action plan, and initi initiating a strategic investment fund to support investments to help address gaps in access to capital for early start developers and community identified priorities. So those are all kind of new things that are reflected in our budget this year, which we think go in support of the plan. So um, in terms of doing business differently, what would you say about that? Well, um, I think, um, in, I don't know about differently. I think our priorities will change. I mean, if you look at the plan, you'll see that there are um, some new initiatives built in there and some new learning that I think has been done by the staff and by the city as a whole. Mm -hmm. And so um, I think you'll see changes in our operation over time. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's meant to be... Um, an, Im an implementable plan as opposed to something we put on the shelf and forget about. Right. So, um, so uh, I, you know, I don't think there's going to be, to really be honest with you, I don't think there's going to be dramatic change tomorrow, mm -hmm. but I think as these new initiatives start to be rolled out, uh, like with our new budget for next year, I think you'll see uh, a shift in our focus, you know, and so we talk about new TIF districts, for example. Right. Um, this new one for for the central city, I mean, everybody knows that, you know, the central city has some issues right now. And so, and 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 lately, you know, we have, we have focused on certain parts of the city that have been underperforming that have needed um, assistance. And the central city, until very recently, for, you know, in the big scheme of things, has not been one of those areas, but it is now. Yeah. So I think um, that's an example where I think you'll see a change in our focus. Okay, thank you. Advanced Portland plan contains uh, specific outcomes for your goals, which uh, TSEC, we always love to see specific outcomes. Um, we'd love to hear more about how you are going to measure progress of those new initiatives in, in the plan and what's your plan for tracking results and reporting back to the community and stakeholders on these outcomes. Take this one. <laughs> Implementation of uh, Advanced Portland is expected to occur from July 2023 through June of 2028. While the city facilitated development of the strategy, actions will require leadership, funding, and engagement from a broad consortium of public, private, and community-based organizations. Accordingly, a steering committee will be established to monitor progress, support accountability, and advise, implementation, advise on implementation. Additionally, an implement, implementation task force will be established to coordinate and implement on city-led actions, which will be guided by and provide regular reporting to city council on progress, challenges, and resources needed related, related to implementation. These two committees will refine the processed actions through the life of the five-year strategy. To deliver on the outcomes outlined in the Advanced Portland and make evidence-based decisions to adjust actions and priorities as needed requires ongoing monitoring of available data. The advanced Portland documents includes high level indicators, including key inclusive growth measures, reflecting and collective, reflecting the collective impact of market shifts, as well as actions by public, private and community based partners. Program level, uh, program level performance metrics will be developed with input from the steering committee to evaluate and make progress on these indicators. Just curious, the, the makeup of the steering committee and the task force, where, where we draw upon to 
I don't know what to do. Yeah, I can certainly help. So uh, as uh, to what Chair Cruz mentioned, we started with a fantastic steering committee and leadership uh, group. And uh, the steering committee moving forward will be an amalgamation of folks from those uh, who have extensive knowledge on what Advanced Portland looked like and how we truth tested to get to where we are so far. So it'll be developed with those folks. Um, and uh, we'll continue to uh, keep that open over five years. We anticipate a few folks might come in and out, but what we recognize is that's a fantastic place for community to both continue to truth test what we've said and what we've lifted up as a plan, um, and then to continue to make certain that it's an iterative plan, right? I don't know that any of us were planning on what occurred in 2020, but to what Chair Cruz mentioned, it meant we also had to consider our work in different ways. And so we hope to have the community next to us to do that through that steering committee uh, process. Oh, sorry, go ahead. For either Chair Cruz or Mr. Myers, um, I noticed when I read the report letter, the one that I referred to earlier, uh, there were some measures included in that transmittal at the back of the plan. And um, they seemed, uh, under the measures for success, um, they seemed to, many of them seemed to rely heavily on the city of Portland's position in relation to uh, peer, peer cities. So I wondered if you could, A, refresh us on what peer cities you are looking at, and B, whether um, for those cities, how recent is their data? I mean, are, if you went to look, would you see 22 data, 21 data, you know, only as, maybe as current as 20? And how reliable do you think those comparative uh, peer city data sets are? I could, do you want to? Would somebody like to? I can I can certainly <laughs> start with that. So the peer, yeah. So the peer cities uh, that we will look at will, of course, be something our steering committee will uh, consider with us as well. So first, we're looking at characteristics that ensure that we're mapping across cities that that make sense to you know. I don't think looking at Portland and New York would make sense, but other cities that that are considered sister cities and those from an economic standpoint that um, allow us to really consider kind of apples to apples or what we'll do. Our economist. Um, Christian Kaler has done a fantastic job about being able to kind of pull those uh, for us and really understand uh, what those metrics look like. So you'll see that in our evaluation framework come out. Um, and you'll see, I think you're uh, alluding to our implementation timeline that really talks about year one, year three, and year five, and us being able to understand kind of the movement uh, based in and looking at our peer cities. I will say what data each city has is totally different. Of course, if you look at data up until 2019, and then what happens after 2019, um, there's a, you know, a lot of nuance to what we see and what we understand. I don't think most groups, most groups are now maybe coming out with 2022 data. And so what's public, what's available for public and what we can gather, our goal is to hopefully connect uh, in most like fashion, right? So if we're looking at 2019 data and that's all, then, then we'll attempt to connect there. If we're looking at data that is up to date up until 2022, at this point, I think that's our goal as well. Um, and really attempting to ensure that we can tell a true story and mirror a story with other cities that make sense, right? So we don't want to be looking at 22 data if all our peer cities are only looking at 2018 or 2019 data, recognizing that there's so much difference there. So our goal is to hopefully share. And that's why we have more than one peer city. I think we're looking at about 10 to give us at least a good uh, track uh, to understand kind of what the trends look like and how we can map ourselves against those. I, I understand the general theory, So, but what I think I heard you tell me was that the peer cities have not been firmly selected at this point? No, we do have, I just don't have oh. a list for you right here, so. Oh, okay, um, I just wondered, could you tell us what they are? When we talk to the port, they always review mm -hmm. the peer airports, and it seems like a pretty set Standard. list. Right, and so we'll look at those consistently. So I don't think that we're gonna be changing those year one and year three, we'll look at different ones. Um, and we can certainly bring those that list to you uh, at a later date, or I can have some of my team kind of attempt to gather that uh, right now for us if you, we want uh, that before we finish. But those same peer cities, uh, again, are, are probably all the methodology around how you look at peer cities will be similar in other spaces to how we will use them uh, for our, our groups that we'll consider. Great, thank you. Yep. Fantastic, yeah. I have the next question. Uh, switching gears a little bit away from the advanced Portland plan, uh, we wanna talk more broadly about 
kind of uh, Prosper Portland's purpose. Uh, we know that part of that purpose is to support businesses. And we hear consistently that businesses are continuing to see big challenges, everything from security, garbage, declining foot traffic, um, let alone other supply chain or economic factors. Um, and that's not just impacting our small businesses, but is now starting, and emerging businesses, but now starting to impact also our anchor institutions, uh, some of which threatening, however serious those threats are, um, to leave the area. Uh, and we're, we're curious about P Prosper Portland's um, kind of approach, thought process, um, and any planning you have and actionable steps that you're, you're taking or planning to take this year that might address some of those issues. Yes, thank you. Uh, this is uh, Peter, uh, Commissioner Platt. Um, I'm sorry, I'm not able to join in person. I'm on paternity leave and uh, not able to join by video because I'm in a darkened nursery right now. So <laughs> uh, I hope you'll forgive that. Um, but in the meantime, um, I did want to add uh, just a general comment um, to help flesh out some of the earlier comments by uh, Chair Cruz. Um, and, condition, and, and um, Commissioner Myers. Um, we, I think generally speaking, what, what Prosper Portland has attempted to do with this, this economic development strategy is kind of go back to basics, right? There has been a, an acknowledged, um, I suppose, over-reliance in the past on Portland's uh, livability and amenities to attract uh, uh, young, uh, talented, creative folks to the city. Um, and that has, we've benefited from that over the last few decades. Um, but the crisis we went through with COVID and the economic downturn, um, and now all of the corollary crises that we're faced with on the streets um, have exposed some of these, uh, the weaknesses in, in that approach. Uh, and so it was the intent of the team and the consultants who we hired uh, to, um, to again, bring things back to basics, which included uh, really reforging connections between the city, between the government, the city that is, and, uh, and business at all levels, um, but specifically focused, of course, on the traded sector. Um, so that, that's a kind of a general global comment. Um, and then to answer your specific comment, um, Prosper continues to offer the Small Business Repair Grant Program, uh, which is funded by City Council, which provides upwards of $10,000 to local small businesses needing immediate repairs, you know, uh, usually due to vandalism, things like window repair. Uh, Prosper also recently launched the Small Business Stabilization Restore Grant Program to support Portland small businesses experiencing hardships res resulting from COVID. Um, uh, with city council allocated American Rescue Plan Act funds, those ARPA funds. Uh, these grants will complement the repair grant program and offer one-time direct grants to help stabilize small businesses by addressing operational expenses for businesses within certain districts. And say from north, from East Portland to North Northeast to 82nd, Central City and Inner West Side. The Restore Grant Program will provide up to $25,000 to eligible small businesses to reimburse for eligible expenses incurred due to damages and vandalism since January of 2022. So while Prosper Portland's programs are focused on providing direct funding to small businesses impacted by the pandemic, staff are also coordinating with the Public Environment Management Office, leading the city's work related to cleaning up non-homelessness related trash, graffiti, illegal dumping and abandoned cars and other such initiatives. So um, we have all heard, of course, through the media of many companies uh, either relocating or thinking about relocating outside the city and Prosper is identifying resources uh, currently available um, and also finding additional resources needed to retain employer presence in the city through uh, Livability and safety, of course, is at the forefront of employers' minds, but we also know the scale and prolonged nature of the crisis means aligned financial tools are also needed to keep companies in Portland. And Prosper has convened an internal team to lead retention responses. This team is both uh, is prepared with both existing incentives and resources, uh, such as the Enterprise Zone and limited tax increment financing funds in key areas, 
and also working directly with partners to identify additional tools needed for tenant retention with a focus on traded sector firms as always and companies that do business in the central city. Prosper also offers loan programs that can be utilized to provide working capital, equipment, and tenant improvement loans to businesses in the city. So those just a, a, a good overview of what we're doing currently to uh, uh, stanch the bleeding, so to speak. <clears throat> can you talk a little bit about the feedback? Oh, there's me. Uh, can you talk a little bit about the feedback you're receiving from um, these component, you know, the, these small businesses, the recipients of these types of small grants and support, um, just kind of, is, is that staunching the bleeding? Is it helping? Is it, is it improving that livability or is it really just kind of a stopgap measure? I'm curious about kind of that dialogue you're having. Yeah, it, it's a great question. And, and as the, the, the representative, uh, small business owner on the commission, uh-huh. um, yeah, I can tell you that it, it, every little bit helps. Um, and I can also tell you that it's never enough. <laughs> so I think uh, it, it's tough for small business retail in particular, um, anywhere in the city, but in particularly those um, in more impacted uh, corridors and neighborhoods. Um, and uh, the truth is the city, you know, in many respects, and like many cities elsewhere, uh, this is not unique to Portland, it's just, our, you know, we we, we lacked the adequate mechanisms to, you know, to respond adequately to these crises, because of course they're, they're unusual, right? They, they don't happen every day. This is not business as usual. So um, what I see helping the most right now are business stabilization, uh, you know, initiatives, right? And a lot of that uh, comes through the peer-to-peer network that was established, you know, years ago uh, through Prosper's initiatives in the various different neighborhoods, right? Neighborhood prosperity initiatives. That has proven to be a very worthwhile investment of time, uh, staff, energy, focus, resources, et cetera, uh, because we have, as it were, we have we have a um, we have a network of information and real-time information and, and trusted relationships with all of these different uh, NPIs and, and through their overlap with the different uh, uh, neighborhood um, uh, business groups. So those have proven to be really active and involved. Um, you know, I'm involved with, for example, my businesses in the Pearl, um, and you know, there is a very active uh, uh, business group uh, representing any number of different uh, retailers in the area. Um, there's overlap also with uh, different um, other neighborhood initiatives. And so we benefit from that. And of course, there are links through those various different initiatives with Prosper and other agencies. Um, so those have proven to be really good sources of resiliency. Um, I think the the challenges are are not the same all the way throughout the city. There are some areas, you know, Old Town, Central City are have gotten disproportionately impacted. Um, and especially with the the overlap between houselessness and behavioral health, right? And 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 for that matter, uh, the drug crisis. And so, you know, there we obviously that is not our purview as an economic development agency. And I think we're counting on a lot of coordination at city council between commissioner Rubio, who now oversees this agency and her counterparts to bring to bear a more coordinated response that does include the security dimension. Um, you know, first and foremost in my mind is, is security for my employees going to and from work. Right. Um, and, uh, and that, and that remains a, a concern. Um, and, uh, so that is something I think that, that again is outside the purview of this agency, but we can certainly raise and represent the voice of small business uh, to make sure that it is is well represented at council. Um, thank you so much, uh, Commissioner Platt, uh, for joining us remotely while you're out on paternity leave. Congratulations. Um, thank you. Your uh, responses, um, s- a lot of it seems to be focused, or at least what you articulated seemed to be focused in some ways on responding to kind of acute changes, the pandemic, hopefully our 
uh, the housing crisis and our streets will end up being, you know, acute. Um, but I also wonder, I mean, you, you had some threads in there about decreased foot traffic that seems a little bit less acute and more about the changing nature of um, consumer decisions, the changing nature of, uh, you know, workplace environs with most more, more people working remotely. I'm wondering if uh, you or I mean, if uh, Prosper is thinking about how to support uh, small businesses, especially um, retailers, but you know potentially all, all sorts of businesses, as folks, you know, as there are larger trends um, that you know might decrease the traditional model. Yeah, no, those great points. Um, I I know those conversations are happening. I don't think anyone has yet a. I don't think anyone in the in the in the country. Uh, has an idea yet how or a working model for how best to stop the, you know, the the so-called downtown death spiral, right? Where offices are vacated due to COVID, more and more remote work becomes normalized. You don't get the same, uh, you know, office footprint that has then an impact on the retail. You start getting these sort of, you know, dead zones and downtown area and, and they're hard, it's hard to recover from that, you know. The, the best thing I can tell you is I think we should still, and that is just my personal opinion as a commissioner, we should be working with our counterparts, various different city agencies to push forward the idea of, of, of committing some kind of resource base, some, some you know, grant pool or something like that in working with developers specifically for office conversions uh, into housing, because obviously we have an acute housing crisis, which it's going to be prolonged. It's not acute. It will last for at least 10 to 15 years just because it is, it's a statewide crisis. Um, and so there's going to be need and pressure on housing for a while. Um, I, I don't see um, a pathway back to a thriving office environment the way that it was pre-COVID anywhere downtown. I just, I don't frankly see that happening. Talking with, you know, the restaurants and coffee shops and other retailers, but I happen to know personally the operators down in that area. Yeah, a lot of them have just pulled out and they just can't do it anymore, right? Um, and so it's, it, I think my response is just, it's going to take a coordinated response. It's, this problem is bigger than one agency can solve. Um, what we can focus on is on, like, like I said, representing the voice of the business community, the small business community, which is disproportionately impacted, but also the traded sector, which brings in those, you know, invaluable traded sector dollars that then circulate through our local economy. You know, I, I think there's there's a lot more work to be done in figuring out how best to support both ends of the spectrum. And uh, and as I said earlier, I think there's some there's some decent amount of groundwork still to be done to rebuild the connections between the business communities, because there are, you know, between the small and big businesses, they are separate communities, unfortunately. Um, and city government. Um, that was something that was a key finding from our consultants was that Portland, unlike many of its peer uh, cities, did not have a thriving connection between the two. They were, we were working in silos. There was government and there's business and, and even many business leaders were saying, I'm, I just don't go to city hall. I don't have those conversations. For, for whatever reason, those cultures developed independently and, and separately. So I think we have a real opportunity to be that bridge between business and government uh, and do it in it with a, you know, with obviously an equity mindset. So I think it is a unique opportunity. I think we have uh, a lot to do still. Thank you very much. Commissioner Ofsink, can I also just offer a part of what we're looking at through the Advanced Portland uh, plan is also considering an office of small business that really looks at those ongoing issues and uh, kind of moving past triage, rapid response to more of the rebuilding um, and kind of just re-engaging around how we're supporting small businesses, really looking at um, permitting issues and all kinds of things across the board. So so look to, to continue to see that from Advanced Portland. And then Commissioner Norton, I just, I was able to find those peer cities for you. Um, so uh, thank you to the staff uh, who were able to do that. Thank you, Justin. Uh, those are Charlotte, San Diego, Oakland, Denver, Austin, Raleigh, Minneapolis, Boston, and Atlanta. So those are the, the set that we're using right now. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. If I could also just add one more point, uh, just to, to kind of pile on to what Commissioner Platt was saying. 
Uh, one of his comments was about the conversion, uh, potential conversion of re retail or office space to residential, which is something that a lot of cities are looking at. And I'm not an expert in this area, uh, and it's not within the purview of our agency, but the city is looking at that and has taken steps to start to promote that and uh, make it easier to get permits and uh, waive SDC charges and things like that. Uh, to try to encourage those conversions. And I think it's early days. I don't even know how many projects have been done so far, uh, but that's an initiative that's ongoing, so. I've been on the TSCC for so long that I think that this is your, for sure, second, but possibly third location, your second name, and now we understand that you have moved on to your second iteration of the uh, financial stability plan. I remember when we were here talking about plan one. So now you've moved on to plan two. What's new? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, <laughs> I will take that question. And I was involved in the first one and uh, our, our, our revised efforts. So... Um, so, and, and I would just preface these prepared comments by saying that, needless to say, um, our um, um, implementation of the plan was a little bit knocked off course uh, by the pandemic and some of the sort of emergency measures that the agency was asked to take on uh, in, in, in light of that. So, but uh, we have continued on, though, looking at the FSP. The original FSP, that's Financial Stability, excuse me, Financial Sustainability Plan, focused on four key components with optimizing public benefits and financial return of the remaining tax increment funds and securing additional public funding as being most critical to the plan. The updated plan re retains many of the original concepts, but is adjusted to incorporate lessons learned based on the first few years of performance and to reflect a new economic landscape, especially due to the impact of the COVID pandemic. The plan retains secured, excuse me, the plan retains securing public resources as foundational to the plan and anticipates the allocation of 25% of the TIF revenue returning to the city's general fund, that's uh, kind of known informally as the boomerang funds, mm -hmm. to support economic development programming in fiscal year 2024 to 2025, consistent with direction from city council. Two other foundational elements include one, defining and optimizing how remaining TIF district funds are invested in alignment with community priorities and district action plans. And two, investing tr strategic investment fund resources generated from returning TIF investments, including loan repayment, property sales, and net operating income. The strategic investment fund will be available citywide and can be used to achieve public benefits and create financial returns through new lending and real estate programming. The fiscal year 2023 to 2024 budget includes a $45 million strategic investment fund that can deploy into new lending and real estate programming. So we're continuing our efforts to kind of diversify um, our uh, revenue sources. And I think, you know, one of the underlying themes that we had from the first plan uh, is sort of the recycling of resources as opposed to a, a much older mindset, which was less about recycling resources and more about just getting the funds out there and deploying the money into certain projects. So uh, in the grand scheme of things, that's where we're headed. So, I mean, I remember the discussions from the uh, 1.0 version, which was we're coming to the end of the uh, uh, TIF financing or we expect that that to be falling off substantially. Well. It, that did happen or is happening now. Yeah. Um, and B, um, at that time, uh, there was discussion about exploring for new revenues. I noticed that was in the budget message for the 23, 23-24 uh, budget as well, this idea of searching for new revenues. My guess is that if your search had been productive, we would be hearing about that. What new revenues are there for you out there to search for? What, what are you considering or looking for? 
Well, I have one prepared uh, response to that, and that is uh, new revenue opportunities include local, state, and federal potential sources. For example, er earlier this spring, Prosper Portland, in partnership with City Bureau Partners, applied to the U.S. Department of Transportation for a $15 million raise grant to fund local street improvements at the Broadway Corridor site. And I think everybody's familiar with that project. Grant awards are expected to be made no later than June 28, 2023. So, you know, grants are not a particularly um, reliable uh, source of long-term funding, but I, I think that's just an example of, some, of a area we might not have looked at as aggressively before, but combined with um, kind of ongoing revenue sources, money from uh, fees, money from interest on loans, kind of recycling of funds, uh, boomerang funds back from the general fund, um, it's a it's a combined package that we're looking at to try to wean ourselves away from the TIF districts TIF district funding, which of course is subject to the TIF cliff. So um, so that's that's where we're headed. I think we're going to talk more about the TIF districts, but thank you very much. <laughs> I have the TIF, TIF, TIF districts question, um, and actually <laughs> it's really timely because last night I was at a. Um, community meeting about the future of 82nd Avenue and there were folks from um, Prosper Portland there and the city and uh, I think also Metro um, and they did a little spiel about that there would be more kind of community engagement about a potential TIF district along 82nd Avenue so it was really interesting. Um, we were wondering if you could describe the current process for starting new TIF districts and how Prosper Portland is engaging communities about that and then um, given the kind of I don't know, inherent wonkiness, you know, complexity <laughs> of TIF district, TIF, TIF, TIF districts. How you're helping, you know, average members of the public really understand kind of the trade-offs and what it would potentially mean um, as a benefit to the given area. Oh, it's my turn um, <laughs> for my prepared answer. Um, the exploration of new TIF districts in East Portland and the cent Central City was identified by community partners during the advanced Portland engagement and outreach. In East Portland, the action also reflects conversations underway that were initiated and are being led by the East Portland Action Plan, EPAP, staff who convened meetings between East Portland community members and partners together with Prosper Portland and the Portland Housing Bureau. EPAP is a community-led effort working together to advocate for all areas of livability. At the June 28th Portland City Council meeting, staff will seek approval of a resolution that would launch a process to explore new TIF districts in East Portland and the Central City. If approved, Prosper Portland and Portland Housing Bureau staff would facilitate an approximately 15-month process and report back to City Council in October 2024. In East Portland, this process includes supporting a 20-member steering committee and up to three geographic specific working groups. This process and approach was created through the early engagement work led by EPAP. The process in the central city will sequentially follow the work in East Portland and is expected to also include convening community partners to explore new central city. You know we love to co convene people. Um, <laughs> central city's TIF districts in alignment with the advanced Portland di direction and to make recommendations to city council. These processes will lean heavily on lessons learned in the Cully TIF district process, including providing TIF district information and education, centering community priorities, perspective during the process, and any plan creation, and providing subject matter and technical expertise as part of the exploration process and any district plan drafting. Again, you know we love to convene community groups. We love to convene, and so from there we'll come up with a process. Thank you. You're welcome. So we're not done with TIFs. <laughs> so uh, tax and increment financing is, uh, I think, probably one of the things that we know uh, that Prosper really relies on and has, you know, that's part of their revenue uh, model and always has been. But there uh, are probably some folks that are wondering, so if you don't have tax increment financing, um, does Prosper continue to exist? So for those folks, what, what would you say? 
Well, and, and I've heard some of the answer already. Um, you've got the diversified revenue that you've talked about and the boomerang funds and these other kinds of things. So you're looking at a different you know, strategic financial model. Um, but this change in the way that you are approaching tax increment financing where the community is much more involved um, is it's a very different sort of model. I'm not familiar with, I haven't heard of this anywhere else. So um, it, it suggests that you're gonna have a level of <coughs> involvement with a community that is much deeper, much broader, much more serious perhaps, because in order to get those tax increment financing districts off the ground, you're going to need the community's buy-in. And so um, if you're not getting, and I'm kind of riffing here because our question is, as written is, is not really this, but if this is my personal interest, because I live in the Cully or near the Cully, and so I'm, I'm seeing some of what uh, this tax increment financing change uh, may, how that may impact my community. So um, do, you, do you think this method is going to work? Where does this come from? Are there others that are doing this? And so could you talk to us about that? Elaborate a little bit. Thank I'll, you. I'll just make, make a few comments on that. So okay. the Cully TIF district uh, that you're referring to really is kind of unique. Mm -hmm. um, and the notion there was that, you know, historically, you know, folks were oftentimes impacted in a negative way by urban renewal. And Prosper Portland is very um, understanding of that. And uh, we've made a lot of efforts over the years to try to uh, mitigate some of those harms to the extent that we can. Uh, but in the future, you know, it's a great tool. TIF is still a great tool to improve areas of the city that are, are uh, underserved and need help. Um, and so we've kind of shifted the philosophy, like you're saying, to rather than a top-down, sort of a bottom-up approach, right. where the community actually said, look, we want to do a TIF district here. We have certain economic goals that we have, but we also want it to um, include sort of anti-gentrification gentrification strategies and things that sort of mitigate some of the negative aspects of urban renewal and TIF. And so in that respect, it really is a unique effort. And um, I think um, my understanding is, is that folks who live over there are and, and have businesses over there are still really supportive of it and are um, kind of excited about uh, seeing it roll out. And I'm hopeful that in the future, as we establish new districts, it'll kind of be the same thing. Uh, because, you know, this just reflects the evolution of the agency and the evolution of our approach uh, to economic development generally. You know, back in the day, uh, you know, there would be a, a blighted neighborhood, you know, to use the term, and they'd tear it down and build it up with new buildings and new development. Well, now we, we take a much different approach. And, um, you know, the, the, um, the other thing about it is, is as you referred to, TIF being the main source of revenue for the agency. That's true, but as you know, it's sort of focused on certain geographic areas. This agency is the economic development agency for the whole city of Portland. So we have kind of a bigger mission, and we're evolving, I think, more towards that than we were back in the day, just focused on pure development and kind of brute force development, if you will. Right. So, yes, please. And I would also say I've been living in North Northeast Portland most of my life first generation born here. Um, and so it's really important that we not repeat the mistakes of the past as an agency, that we do things differently, that we are truly listening to the different communities. Because in the Cully District, there are definitely many di um, communities of color. Um, and so it's really important that we listen and that we learn and not just listen to go forward, but we listen to really hear and to do and to have some action forward in a different way. And that's really important to the city of Portland as a whole, because again, as chair has stated, we serve the entire city of Portland and then we are and, um, accountable to that. And so it's really important that all those underrepresented voices that were do not historically have a seat at the table, make sure that those voices are heard and so that we don't go back to, I remember when my parents 
grandparents' home was taken back in the old Albina, that we don't do that and that we are doing things differently. And Cully does look differently today, but it's because we've had community voices at that table, and it's really important that we continue to have that, <clears throat> those voices at the table. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Oh, yeah, I'll go ahead and answer the question. Um, most U.S. cities have a bureau that leads the city's economic development and community development services. While TIF has been <coughs> and continues to be a primary source in implementing the economic development and urban development work of Prosper Portland through the FSP update, update we have diversified how Prosper Portland is funded to ensure less singular reliance on TIF resources, deploying a balanced approach in investing remaining TIF and non-TIF funds alongside increased general fund support are the foundation to maintaining economic development work going forward. These new resources also offer the advantage of providing resources to implement advanced, advanced Portland priorities citywide rather, th rather than in specific areas for specific projects. TIF continues to be an important and comp complement, complementary, um, com com can't even speak, sorry, <laughs> resource, particularly in specific areas where there is a need for public funds to help stabilize bis small businesses and residents and leverage inclusive growth in the face of market forces. We anticipate any future TIF districts will continue to build on lessons learned through practices like the Neighborhood Prosperity Network, five-year action plans, and the governance remodel, and the governance model in the Cully TIF district creation. So unsurprisingly to anyone, I think we've discussed the housing crisis and its community impacts with many of our districts this year. I think uh, soil and water conservation got off the hook on that one, but um, just about every other one seems to have a housing question. Um, and I think we, you know, I think Peter maybe touched upon this earlier, how it's not really within the purview of the agency, but. I mean, do you see Prosper Portland having a role in the, the housing and house assistance crisis? And do you see this evolving in the coming years? And what key partners do you think you could coordinate with to work on that? So I get to answer that question. Yes, it does have a role. And the um, Prosper Portland allocates 45% of its annual TIF revenue to the Portland Housing Bureau in alignment with the City Council's adopted affordable housing set-aside policy to deliver on regulated affordable rental and home ownership housing within TIF districts. The set-aside focuses on delivery of regulated affordable housing units serving those in the incomes between zero and 60% area median income. Prosper Portland invests in middle income housing in various ways in North and Northeast, a portion of Prosper Portland's North Northeast Community Development Initiative Action Plan investments are administered by the housing, the Portland Housing Bureau to expand the availability of their single family residential home ownership programs, the down payment assistance loan program and home repair program to those uh, with incomes between 80 and 120 area medium income. In Lens, uh, at Oliver Station, Lentz Common, 92nd and Herald, and at Gateway at, uh, at the Nick Fish, Prosper Portland has invested in public-private partnerships to deliver on market rate, middle income, or mixed income projects to respond to community advocacy for funding uh, for, for mixed uh, income housing communities. In Old Town, Prosper Portland and TIF, and Portland's TIF district funding commitments to Old Town Action Old Town Action Plan are focused on attracting new neighborhood investments and activating key properties by supporting market rate housing that complies with the city's inclusionary zoning policy. Prosper Portland is engaged with the Portland Housing Bureau, Bureau of Sustainability, and the Bureau of Development Services in identifying citywide strategies to unlock middle, middle income and market rate housing together with additional regulated affordable housing. This is also reflected in the number of advanced Portland recommendation, including increasing mixed income housing in central city subdistricts with a lack of residential use and addressing housing production across con the, the, a continuum of affordability along our commercial cor corridors. Given our history of partnership with the Portland Housing Bureau and direct involvement 
with funding to support middle income or mixed income projects, we expect staff will be increasingly engaged with citywide discussions on housing production. Um, in the interest of time, I think we'll end our questions there. I want to thank everybody, uh, everyone for their contributions to today's discussion. We particularly appreciate uh, the dialogue back and forth in your uh, candor with us as we throw new and follow-up questions um, to the table. So with that, um, I will close the hearing and open a regular <laughs> business meeting of the TSCC. Uh, commissioners, do you have any additional comments on Prosper Portland's budget? Uh, Allegra, can you please provide the staff recommendation for the certification letter? Yes, I'd be happy to. Uh, I would like to start by commending Prosper Portland staff on all their hard work putting together the budget. I know it ends up all in one document, but we know what a huge amount of work it represents for months and months. Um, additionally, we're very glad that for the opportunities to collaborate with Prosper Portland staff throughout the year, whether it's discussing possible budget law questions or this year, uh, we worked with Prosper Portland staff to improve some of our annual report and make sure we're describing TIF districts well. So we just so appreciate that, that partnership, and I wanted to mention it. Uh, for the fiscal year 23-24 approved budget, TSCC staff found the budget estimates to be reasonable for the purposes stated and the budget to be in substantial compliance with budget law. TSCC staff have no recommendations or objections to the budget. Thank you, Allegra. May I have a motion authorizing the commission to sign the certification letter as recommended by staff? Turn. Um, I'll move. <laughs> <laughs> it's my turn. I'll take Mark moves and Matt seconds. Um, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 The Prosper Portland budget is so certified by TSEC. Allegra will provide the certification letter shortly after this. With that, I'll adjourn. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Great. Thanks to you. Thanks for the great questions and dialogue. Yeah. So, sure, sure. Yeah, folks want to take a little short break? Short break? Yeah. I wanted to thank you. I attended the high school poetry slam this year. Oh, you did? And there you were, up on the stage. Yes, yes. That was a lot of fun, actually. That was a really great time. Yeah, yeah. One of our family friends.
Board of Commissioners meeting is now convened. Pam, will you please call the roll? Commissioner Platt. Peter? Yes, here. I know you're busy. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Commissioner Rodriguez? Here. Commissioner Stoudemire Wesley? Present. Commissioner Myers? Here. Chair Cruz? Here. Thank you. Thank you. I have a brief uh, notice to read. As a result of the COVID-19 pandemic and the need to limit in-person contact and promote social distancing, Prosper Portland is also streaming the meeting electronically as allowed by state law. Prosper Portland has provided access for the public to listen to the audio broadcast of this meeting. The public can also provide written testimony to the commission by emailing prospercommissioners at prosperportland.us. Again, prospercommissioners at prosperportland.us. Okay, so uh, next item is commissioner reports. Does anyone have anything they'd like to report? No. Um, I attended the PBA uh, luncheon, um, annual luncheon, and it was um, very good, great information. It was nice to see everyone there for my event day gift. Um, <laughs> and I think it was one other event we attended too, but I yes, can't think did. of the name yeah. of it so right now. Awami. Oh, the Awami event as well. Yep, <laughs> good, very good. Oh, no. Um, yes, so... Um, uh, I would just uh, add that uh, I attended those two events with my event date, Commissioner, Commissioner Stoudemire Wesley, and then also attended the um, Celebrating Trade event put on by the Oregon Consular Corps. So, okay. Um, next up, we have the uh, Executive Director Report, and Shabri Vickers is sitting in today for Kimberly Branham, who's on vacation. Yeah, thank you so much, Chair Cruz, uh, and happy summer solstice. As you mentioned, I'm filling in for Executive Director Branham, who is on a much-deserved vacation. Um, <clears throat> just a few notes here, and then we have a fantastic uh, lineup of staff to introduce you to. So June is Pride Month, and there is and has been an array of events and activities happening throughout the city. Uh, and for a list of upcoming events, please visit portlandpride.org uh, and then click on the official events tab, many things to see there. Uh, many offices and businesses like ourselves were closed on Monday, June 19th, in honor of the Juneteenth holiday, commemorating the emancipation of enslaved Africans, or excuse me, enslaved Americans. Um, and I truly hope that everyone had a chance to participate in one or more of the events happening throughout Portland this past weekend. Um, My People's Market occurred earlier this month and was a huge success with thousands of community members joining us. And we want to say thank you first to Amanda Park, Michelle Comer, Lisa Norwood, Burke Nelson, Ness, and Sean Ullman, who, uh, for whom this work wouldn't have been possible. And major thanks to all of the staff uh, and volunteers who uh, supported the market and really ensured that we could have such a great event. Um, our next market will be in November, so we hope that you can join us and, and plan to uh, keep your eyes out for details on that. I am pleased to announce that Prosper Portland has opened a new grant opportunity, the Small Business Stabilization Restore Grant, which launched just this last Friday. The Restore Grant will provide one-time direct grants to support Portland small businesses experiencing hardships resulting from the COVID-19 pandemic. The grant is intended to help stabilize small businesses with up to $25,000 in financial assistance for operational expenses related to impacts of vandalism and break-ins. And I want to acknowledge just how difficult it is to quickly build and launch a brand new grant program. And I need to recognize uh, some of the folks who have worked on this important project. Uh, to Ellen Bolas Edmonds, a uh, huge thank you to her. Also to Lisa Norwood, Rachel Benton, Laz Romanicu, who is also here, uh, Anne Mangan and Amy Nagy. And for more information on the Restore Grant, uh, folks can visit prosperportland.us and click on the Restore Grant banner. And please note, applications for the first round of grant funding close Monday, June 26th, so coming up uh, here pretty soon. Uh, Prosper Portland's Office of Events and Film hosted two activations today as part of our work with the ongoing Every Wednesday campaign. We organized events at Director's Park and the Oak Street Plaza adjacent to the U.S. Bank Tower, also known as Big Pink. And so we want to also acknowledge, again, Amanda Park and Michelle Comer for leading this wonderful series. And we invite all of you to visit either location between 11 a.m. and 1 p.m. every Wednesday, just as the campaign suggests. Um, and to view a full list of upcoming events and activations, visit everywednesday.com. And you can also sign up for weekly text alerts to ensure you never miss out on upcoming events in the city that we all love and are hoping to restore. Um, 
Portland will, uh, will be the only North American location for the world's most popular electric car race happening this coming weekend, the ABB Formula E World Championship. And so I encourage all race fans to get tickets and head to Portland International Raceway this Saturday, the 24th. Um, I'll also mention as part of Prosper Portland's focus on clean energy, our We Build Green Cities team has put together a list of events showcasing Portland's electric mobility and clean energy community before and after the Formula E race. So you can go to webuildgreencities.com and click on the events tab for more information there. Um, and lastly, we know that uh, as Commissioner Stoudemire and yourself joined us, uh, many Prosper Portland colleagues attended the Portland Metro Chamber, uh, Chamber's annual event on June 15th, where they announced their, their new branding and the collective. Uh, and it was great to hear from Governor Kotek, Commissioner Rubio, Chamber President and CEO Andrew Hone, and many, many other leaders. And we're just so pleased to hear that uh, many of the topics the speakers touched on are priorities for Prosper Portland um, and our work in the Advanced Portland Plan. And so we're excited about that. Thank you for your attendance there. Next, as previously mentioned, we have a fabulous group of staff here to introduce, and um, I look forward to taking the time uh, to introduce each one of them. So uh, when I introduce you, if you want to uh, just wave so, so our, our board of commissioners know who you are, I'm going to start with uh, Toby Cowell. I'm pleased to announce that Toby Cowell has joined Prosper Portland, is our human resources manager. And prior to coming to Prosper Portland, Toby worked as an HR information systems analyst for Mount Hood Community College. Uh, an HR manager for New Narrative, a local nonprofit mental health facility, and most recently, regional HR director for Rexel USA, Platt Electrical Supplies, a global wholesale distributor. Toby holds a senior level certification in, in human resources and has degrees in computer information systems and operations management from um, Oregon Institute of Technology and an MBA in HR management from George Fox University. As a native Portlander, Toby loves to spend her spare time with her family enjoying outdoor activities, mostly hiking, uh, and traveling with the personal goal of visiting all of the national parks. Toby, we are thrilled to have you. <laughs> Next, I'd like to introduce Jennifer Pruess. I'd like to, um, who is our new senior administrative coordinator and will be supporting the development and investment department. Jennifer brings a range of experience in team and project management coordination and communication spanning across cooperatives and nonprofit organizations. Uh, organization, excuse me. Jennifer has a particular love of collaboration, organization, and the support of teams at every level within an organization. Helping project and pr uh, program teams achieve their goals is her North Star, and she is driven by mutual success and her love for Portland. Welcome to us, Jennifer. Um, next is Laz uh, Romanq, uh, who has accepted a limited term position as our project coordinator one for the Blue Development Team. Hello, Laz. Um, in this role, he will be working to support our ARPA-funded programs, including the Repair Grant and the upcoming Small Business Stabilization Grant. Laz came to us as a temporary HR worker in August of last year, and we are thrilled to now work with him in this new capacity. Prior to Prosper Portland, he worked at Starbucks for over a decade, designing and leading programs for racial equity in hiring and retention practices, including a series of bias trainings and thought exercises for managers. Outside of work, you can catch Laz playing video games, looking at flowers in the rain, loudly proclaiming bad takes on the latest Drag Race episode, and eating cute desserts from local bakeries, and trying to take care of 80-plus houseplants. Congratulations on your new role, Laz. <laughs> okay, <laughs> an amendment <laughs> notes here. Um, and next, I would like to welcome Aname Ekbedi. Uh, Prosper Portland's new real estate portfolio analyst on the asset and investment team. In this role, he will be tasked with providing critical real estate portfolio, portfolio analysis, creating models and making recommendations regarding Prosper Portland's assets and investments. Anime comes to us after working as an investment analyst for a family office in Vancouver, Washington. And with his background in finance and understanding of the real estate market, he will provide valuable insights and analysis to support the team. Outside of work, Anime loves watching and playing soccer. His favorite team is Arsenal. Uh, and he also enjoys trusting or trying new restaurants and traveling when he can. We are so happy to welcome you to the Prosper Portland team, Anime. Thank you. And next, Brad Reynolds. I am very happy to announce that Brad Reynolds has joined Prosper Portland as a principal technical accountant on the finance team. In his role, Brad will assist in the implementation of new accounting requirements 
perform reconciliations, support accounting processes, while also helping to lead the annual audit process and production of our annual comprehensive financial report. Brad was born and raised in Idaho with a short stint in South America. And Brad, his wife, and daughter love the Oregon coast so much that they wanted to move closer no matter what the cost and look forward to exploring more of Portland and the surrounding areas. Brad holds a CPA and has worked in public accounting and and as an auditor for the past seven years and previously worked in the parking industry for 11 years. Congratulations, Brad. Next, um, I'm happy to announce that Angelica Butler has joined the Entrepreneurship and Community Economic Development Team as Project Coordinator 1. Angelica comes to us from FACT, Oregon, where she served as a program specialist and will be supporting programming on the team funded by the American Rescue Plan Act. She will be working closely with Dan Ron and Amy Fleck Rossetti on the Portland Small Business Hub, Black-owned business technical assistance, cultural chamber capacity building, venture Portland programming, and workforce development efforts. Angelica brings a strong background in communications, relationship building, project management, and accounting experience to the team, and we are so excited to have Angelica on board. Uh, Next, Latasha Williams. I'd like to introduce uh, Latasha, who has joined the Human Resources team as an HR consultant. Latasha is a Portland native and holds a bachelor's degree in communication with an MBA in organizational leadership management from the University of Arizona and Concordia, Concordia University, respectively. Latasha has 18 years of experience in human resources, prioritizing equity and meticulous community involvement, excuse me, meticulous hiring practices to diversify the workforce. She has a passion for helping others, which is reflected in her community involvement and public service through various organizations, such as Junior Wildcat Recruiters, Minority Student Recruiters, Feed the Mass, Now Oregon, Dress for Success, National Association of Health Service Executives, and the Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated. In her free time, she enjoys spending time with her husband and five children, children, traveling, being a foodie, hiking, attending comedy shows and concerts, scrapbooking, and engaging in community service. Welcome to the Prosper Portland team, Latasha. We're so glad to have you. And last but not least, we have Paul Gagliardi. Finally, um, I'm excited to announce that Paul has joined the Blue Development Team within the Development and Investment Department as Program Manager, uh, excuse me, Project Manager 1. His position will focus on large land development projects, including within the Central East Side. And Paul comes to us with a significant experience in both project and construction management. Most recently, he worked with, with Intel on their capital projects, including a substantial factory upgrade to support wafer assembly technology development. He has degrees in, uh, in business and engineering and a master's in urban and regional planning. Paul is excited to expand his focus beyond construction and support some of our broader land use and development projects that stand to have a significant impact on how our city looks, functions, and benefits. Please um, join me in welcoming this fantastic group of new staff to Prosper Portland. Great. And I'll hand well, back thank, to you. Yes, thanks very much for that. And uh, on behalf of the board, uh, welcome. We're really happy to have all of you and uh, just really grateful for all the credentials and experiences that you bring. Um, you're going to add a lot to the agency, so we really appreciate it. So thank you. Um, all right. So next up, we have the meeting minutes. Would someone like to make a motion to approve the May 15, 2023 minutes? So moved. Thank you. Second. Thank you. All those in favor of approving the minutes? Aye. 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 All right. Aye. Minutes are, minutes are approved. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, public comments. Pam, None. do we have? No? None. None? Okay. All right. Uh, if anybody does want to make a public comment, uh, you can, as I mentioned earlier, you can email prospercommissioners at prosperportland.us. Okay. On our regular agenda, um, number seven is an action item. Adopting the annual budget of Prosper Portland for the fiscal year beginning January 1, 2023 and ending June 30, 2024 and making appropriations. And Tony Barnes will present. Welcome, Tony. Uh, Good afternoon, Chair Cruz and Commissioners and Director Vickers. Good to see you this afternoon. I'm Tony Barnes, he, him, Finance Manager for Prosper Portland. And I'm going to be presenting the uh, uh, recommended adopted budget for fiscal year um, 23-24 today. Uh, Per Oregon state budget law, 
the uh, budget may be adopted following council, or sorry, approval by city council and certification by the Tax Supervising and Conservation Commission. Uh, exhibit A to the resolution that's attached uh, illustrates both in total and by fund uh, resources and appropriations as required by local budget law. The, the schedule illustrates the budget that was approved by city council on May 18th and the budget recommended for adoption today. Uh, local budget allow law allows for the governing body, the commission, to make changes to expenditures in any fund that do not exceed 10% of the approved budget of any one fund. Uh, next slide, please. And this is the action requested, and we can move to the next. Oops, thank you. <laughs> so uh, shown on this slide is a summary is of all resources rolled up in Exhibit A of the resolution, the total change from council uh, approved budget on May 18th. Uh, changes include reducing uh, one-time funding by $131,000. This is a temporary change to match the city's budget that was not included, but will be added back in the fall. So it's a, just a temporary change. The largest change is incorporating to resources here $5 million in final tax increment uh, bond proceeds that were previously held by the city of Portland as a reserve fund for the downtown waterfront district. Uh, this district is sunsetting, it's closing down. Last resources, the bonds are paid off and those resources now can be incorporated into Prosper Portland's budget. Um, these resources will go to support uh, primarily the Old Town Action Plan uh, as planned projects uh, that's in the budget, both in next year's budget as well as in the five-year forecast. Uh, the service reimbursements shown at the bottom of the resources uh, show a represent of payments from various funds to the Administrative Overhead Fund. This is increased here to offset several increases in the administration budget that I'll speak to in a moment. Next slide, please. Uh, the roll-up of expenditures and total fund requirements in Exhibit A uh, show total recommended expenditures of about $217.6 million. This is a change of $661,000 from the council-approved budget. I'll discuss these changes in the next few slides in more, um, more detail. Total contingency increases $4.4 million. Um, total contingency is about $178 million in next year's budget. The contingency here can be appropriated throughout the year through a budget amendment, uh, through any um, revision, uh, but are currently programmed to future years. So in the fiscal year 24-25 budget, and 25-26 budget, and uh, future years. Uh, primarily allocated to action plan commitments that aren't spending next fiscal year. Uh, note that total transfers included in the budget here include a transfer of um, uh, $45 million. This is the key portion of the uh, updated financial sustainability plan um, that was presented earlier in the year. The transfer of $45 million uh, from various TIF district funds that uh, was identified in that plan to create the strategic investment fund. Um, most of that resides in the contingency in the $178 million. There is an appropriation of about $3 million for starters, for economic development and lending programs in next year's budget. Uh, during the year, staff will evaluate programming and recommend any additional changes that move those portions of $45 million back out into different line items. Uh, next slide, please. The next couple of slides uh, recap what council approved um, as far as city general fund, uh, recreational t cannabis tax funding, and um, American Rescue Plan um, funds that are incorporated into the budget. Um, as part of the action, council appropriated over uh, $20 million in ongoing and one-time general fund, uh, recreational cannabis funding, for support of the economic um, stabilization recovery um, and further enhanced economic development service to household businesses and community, community partners in both the city's budget and now incorporated in the Prosper Portland budget. Um, the actions of City Council was substantially in alignment with recommendations by the Community Budget Committee and uh, the board as part of the overall budget development process. Um, general fund allocations here are about $6.7 million. Uh, that's, that's fairly similar to prior allocations with an um, um, increase of about 3.5%, 4% incorporated. Uh, includes a core funding for Neighborhood Prosperity Network 
inclusive business resource network, uh, my people's market, workforce development, uh, business advancement and traded sector work. Uh, that's, again, consistent with um, uh, most, most annual funding. There's one-time funding incorporated too for general fund here. Um, some of this is funding that was appropriated by city council last year and that we're carrying over into the, uh, the new budget. There is some new funding, however, uh, related to central city um, uh, strategy, the $200,000 that council appropriated that will support uh, TIF exploration processes and, and, um, and uh, further uh, strategy development over the next year. Uh, next slide, please. The other component of the $20.5 million in general funding cannabis is the $11.2 million in um, cannabis fund funding by city council. It includes a couple of different components. It includes existing ongoing funding for the inclusive business resource network of about $1 million, as well as my people's market of $185,000. But also this year, uh, one of the, the larger shifts in the budget is a transfer of city council uh, funding from civic life of $10 million in cannabis funding. This incorporates uh, reimagined Oregon funding of uh, $4.9 million in prior year funding and $2 million in new ongoing funding, as well as a social equity and economic development program, uh, the SEED fund, uh, that's uh, $2 million from prior year funding as well as $1 million in new funding. So the new funding is anticipated to be uh, ongoing from year to year. Uh, but the one-time funds will be spent down over uh, this next year and, and maybe into, into the next year. Uh, next slide, please. And then one of the other large components from council uh, approval was a $10.3 million in American Rescue Plan funds. This includes about uh, $1.9 million in small business repair grants. Uh, $1.4 million in small business stabilization, uh, $2.5 million in adult youth workforce development, and uh, $1 million uh, towards Venture Portland. There is $1.9 million for uh, the Fairfield um, commercial acquisition, ground floor acquisition. Uh, we are partnering with the city, with the city budget office and grants office to look at uh, those funds could be maybe uh, exchanged for other funding instead of federal funds, since this will be now a long-term asset that's held by Prosper Portland. Um, so we're looking at different uh, ways of uh, addressing that um, that acquisition outside of using American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, next slide, please. The next couple of slides uh, focus on recommended changes uh, between what council approved and what we're recommending today for adoption. Um, as I mentioned, there's a, a maximum increase of 10% for any one fund that can be adopted by uh, the governing body um, in the final budget action. Uh, most of the changes are well below that, um, but I want to highlight some of the, some of the recommended changes uh, before you. Uh, in the category of administration, there's an increase uh, recommendation of $440,000. Uh, this is primarily adjustments for uh, personnel and uh, materials and services that uh, have been recommended since the original uh, rec requested budget and proposed budget in January and then in, in April. Um, this includes uh, one-time expenditures for an audit of the Equal Pay Act, um, purchase of replacement IT servers, as well as improvements to the commission room uh, in this room as well as uh, about $180,000 to increase personnel services. And this is primarily adjustments in the terms of limited term employees uh, throughout the year, as well as uh, recognizing a student employee um, program, as well as some updated benefit information we've received since um, the original draft budget was released. So overall, it's, it's less than a, about a 2% increase in the overall personnel budget. Uh, but aligns with um, the total positions that have been recommended going forward uh, in the prior versions. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, economic development, uh, there's a negative, I'm sorry, um, a decrease of $200,000. This is a combination of some increases and decreases, uh, primarily related to um, a decrease of general fund programming that's, again, a, a temporary decrease that will be reincorporated in the fall budget uh, when council reconvenes on the budget in fall. Uh, there's also some uh, uh, increases and decreases in contracts to offset uh, some of the personnel changes. 
And next slide, please. In property redevelopment, there's a $422,000 overall increase um, across different funding sources. Most of this is related to a, uh, this is a net increase. Most of it's related to increases in property management. And of the property management increases, uh, it's incorporating an estimated 30% increase in insurance premiums. We're still working with our broker on um, final quotes and looking at different options, but uh, we anticipate um, a much higher premium amount uh, for property insurance for next fiscal year. And so this, this budget incorporates what we, we feel is a, um, uh, a good cushion to, to accommodate that, but we're still in the process of, of looking at different options, incorporating it. It also includes $94,000 for design and consulting at the Inn Convention Center and um, some decreases in personnel that's allocated to property development projects. And the next slide, please. So the next steps um, going forward are uh, implementation of the general fund and cannabis fund um, intergovernmental agreement with the city budget office, which incorporates these funds, as well as the housing set aside uh, policy and coordination with the uh, Portland Housing Bureau. And as we get into the fiscal year, um, a key part of the work plan is um, monitoring the budget, but also now monitoring the updated financial sustainability plan um, and coming up with um, key reports and key mechanisms to report back on how we're um, implementing the plan going forward. And that concludes my presentation. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, no questions here. I would just note uh, for people listening in that a couple of the items on our consent agenda that won't be discussed today tie into those uh, next steps that Tony mentioned. Anybody like to ask any questions, comments? All right. Well, thanks. As always, thanks for your great work on the budget. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much. And I would like to give some appreciations real quick uh, to uh, Courtney Cohn and Chan Saley on the budget team for all their hard work during the year. And of course, all the leadership, Justin Douglas with the budget committee and uh, Director Vickers as well. Thank you very much for your support and assistance throughout the year. Great, thank you. All right, well, uh, that was a great presentation. Would somebody like to make a motion to adopt the annual budget of Prosper Portland, that's resolution number 7485. So moved. Thank you. Second. So second. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All those in favor of adopting resolution number 7485? Aye. 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 Passed Aye. unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, next up uh, is another action item. This is authorizing an exception to sublease guidelines at Alberta Commons for a sublease with Micro Enterprise Services of Oregon, otherwise known as MISO. And Kay Little will present. Welcome, Kay. Good to see you. Yeah, that works a little better. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Cruz, Commissioners, and uh, Director Victor, Vickers. <laughs> uh, my name is Kay Little. I'm the Asset and Investment Manager here at Prosper Portland. Um, and I'm happy to be here um, to discuss our proposal to lease one of our spaces at Alberta Commons to MISO for the operations of a maker's market uh, retail incubator. Uh, next slide, please. We can go ahead and go to the next one. Um, so first, I just want to ground you in, in the space that is under consideration. Um, it is actually located in the Alberta Commons uh, shopping center. Um, it is on the corner of uh, Northeast Sumner and Martin Luther King uh, Jr. Boulevard. Uh, this space is the largest of three spaces that we have a master lease on. It's about 2,300 square feet. Um, and so you'll see, see a picture there um, with the former <coughs> occupant uh, greenhouse um, uh, gallery and boutiques name on it. Um, next slide, please. Um, a little history about the project. Um, it is a 25,000 uh, 25, uh, square foot shopping center um, with uh, natural grocers as the anchor. Um, it's about two acres and it was developed by Majestic Realty. Um, Prosper Portland actually entered into a master, with, master lease with Majestic Realty 
And then um, a couple of years later, in 2017, the board actually approved a resolution that set the minimum lease rate at $18 a square foot. Um, in the fall of 2018, um, we executed subleases with three um, tenants um, in the space. And so we had a lease with uh, Kaysen's Fine Meats, which is actually on the corner of Northeast Alberta and Martin Luther King Jr. Boulevard. Uh, Champions Barbershop, which is on the corner of Sumner um, in uh, uh, MLK, which is right adjacent to the greenhouse, uh, the former greenhouse uh, gallery and boutique. Um, greenhouse actually vacated the space in February of uh, 2022, and so the space was vacant until December of 2022, uh, when Prosper Portland then donated uh, the temporary use of the space to Miso. Uh, for the organization's uh, Maker's Winter Market. Um, so now we've extended that uh, use permit and Miso has been able to host several additional markets uh, during the last few months, uh, including one this past weekend uh, for the Juneteenth celebration, which was pretty fascinating to go out there and see um, all the folks. Um, next slide, please. Um, so during the time that um, Miso was, uh, had moved into the space and was using it is where the concept of the maker's market was really born. And it did come from the fact that with so many uh, entrepreneurs that um, are makers and they're trying to move from a home-based business to a brick and mortar operation, um, of course, there's a lot of moving parts with doing that. Um, and just having the, the technical expertise, understanding how to go about leasing, and of course, even just the cost of doing that. Um, and so Miso will use this space uh, to create a community uh, boutique, uh, essentially, where, where one entrepreneurs will have the opportunity to sell their products within a brick and mortar environment. Um, but it will also allow Miso to provide them with other hands-on experience in things such as merchandising, uh, inventory, space layout and design, and then some of those things that are really behind the scene but are also very essential for a business, such as you know, bookkeeping and accounting practices. Um, it will also offer an opportunity for um, BIPOC entrepreneurs who may not be MISO clients um, to also begin to establish a brick and mortar presence for their business and help them to see how to sell uh, within a retail environment. Um, matter of fact, some uh, folks who are within the Mercatus uh, directory also were able to sell their products um, at the market. Um, Miso also plans to feature an art gallery in the space for BIPOC artist entrepreneurs. And within that, um, Miso will also provide access to technical assistance and other small business resources uh, to help those artists to learn both the financial and small business fundamentals that they need in order to operate that business. And then Miso also envisions using the space to um, serve the community at large, um, it actually um, providing space for community meetings um, and other events um, and things that will help to celebrate the neighborhood. Um, I know this last um, weekend um, there was some uh, working collaboration with Old Town Pizza across the way, and so it was just very interesting to see how Sumner was really activated by all of that activity. Uh, next slide, please. The next two slides kind of highlight what the market looks like. Uh, here's a shot from um, the, the mezzanine level um, of the space. I'm looking down onto the shop. Um, it's really, I, I think it's really beautiful to walk into the space and just see how it's curated and just really laid out. It's a very inviting uh, environment. Um, and as you see, it just looks like any retail boutique that you might find um, in any of our neighborhoods. Um, next slide, please. Um, and here's just another scene from uh, from the market. I don't know if this is from this weekend or not, but it was it was very vibrant and a lot of things that were happening there. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so here's a little bit about the financial fundamentals. And so the board did approve um, the current leash rate for the tenants, which is at $18 a square foot. It has been at 18 since they executed <coughs> those leases a couple of years ago. They're actually set to begin escalating um, next year. Um, current tenants, which in this case we're talking about Kaysen and Champions, are paying $6.69 a square foot um, in triple nets. And so their total all-in between their base rent and the triple nets right now is $24.69. 
the proposed rate for MISO is actually, um, we're proposing a rate of $14 a square foot, um, with the initial CAMs being at $8 a square foot, and they will also have an escalation. Uh, so their proposed all-in is $22 a square foot if you include both. So when you take a look at the five-year period that the lease is proposed to be in place, you're looking at a difference of about $48,000 in revenue that Prosper Portland will forego to have them in that space, or roughly about $9,700 a year um, in order to have this really on-hand technical assistance provided uh, to a number of businesses. Um, I know in talking to um, uh, the executive director, Kobe Lewis, who is also here to answer any questions that you might have, you know, they serve 40-some uh, retail entrepreneurs generally in each market. So just to think about how many businesses will be supported uh, during that five-year period, and this really seems like quite the bargain uh, when it comes to the rent that we're foregoing. Um, next, next slide, please. And so, um, and just looking at the strategic alignment, um, we see that it does help to foster wealth creation within uh, communities of color. It definitely creates healthy, complete neighborhood, and it's nice to have that space um, activated um, and, and just the support that it also provides to the folks that are across the street in Vanport. Um, and then it does align with the Community Benefits Agreement for Alberta Commons by supporting a local business and job growth, and again, uh, enabling wealth uh, creation opportunities uh, for people of color and low-income uh, community members. Um, and so with that, um, we would ask that the board uh, approve this action to uh, allow us to uh, provide a, a lease rate that is below that minimum. I'm curious if you have uh, any questions for me or for executive. Director Kirby Lewis. Great. Thank you. Good presentation and uh, good good uh, opportunity, I think. Does anybody have any comments or questions? No? Okay. Uh, Ms. Lewis, did you want to say anything? Any comments? Or We don't have any questions for you, but if you want to, if there's anything you'd like to say, please feel free. Great. Great. Thank you, and thanks for coming today. Appreciate it. Okay. Well, uh, would someone like to make a motion to approve number resolution? Excuse me, resolution number seven four eight six, authorizing the exception to sublease guidelines. Make a motion to approve the motion. <laughs> Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Passes. Thank you, Kay. Great. Thank you. Okay, uh, we have one last, last uh, item, and that is to approve the consent agenda. So there are three resolutions. We'll just vote on them all at the same time. Resolution number 7489, 7490, and 7491. Would somebody like to make a motion to approve all of those? Oh, excuse me, and seven, resolution number 7488 and 7487 as well. Sorry. I make a motion that we approve all three. <laughs> all, all, yeah. Okay. All, all, second. Yeah. Second. Thank you. All right. All those in favor of approving the various resolutions under the consent agenda? <laughs> Aye. 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 Thank you. All right. Aye. Okay. Passes unanimously. Thanks very much. And uh, there being no further items, our meeting is now adjourned. Thank you. you might make it. What's that? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I'm meeting with KGW. Yeah. Okay. Nine minutes away, it says. So. Five o'clock. Bobby wins.